Good evening, everyone. Now, we always talk about God in church, but do we really know who God is? And is our understanding of God based on our own preference, our own definition, or our own imagination? In fact, if we think about this, the world that we are living in will never want us to ponder about God. The world that we live in will never want us to care even about uh, who is this God and is He even exist, exist, existing. Instead, what does the world deal with us? The world will keep flooding us with what? With trivialities of life, like what to eat, what to wear, where to have fun, uh, how to earn more money. And uh, the world will keep reminding us of the various deadlines we have to keep. In other words, the world will always occupy us with things of this earth. I mean, of course, some of these things that I've just mentioned about uh, our dressing, our bread and butter issue, our work, our deadlines, our health, it's not that all these things are not important. But compared to it eternal stuff, compared to God and who God is, all these things that I mentioned are in fact very trivial things. And so it's not that we cannot care about things on earth, but if we care about things on earth and we ignore who is God, we don't care about eternal life, we don't care about heaven, we don't care about spiritual truth, then something is not so right. So who is God and how does this God relate to us? This is one important question we all need to have answer to. And this is also uh, what we have been focusing, if you recall, in the month of January, where we keep focusing our thematic message on who God is and in knowing God deeper. And so today, Finally, we are back to the book of Exodus after quite a long break. And today, we will again go back to one key question that Moses posed to God. And that is the question of God, who are you? What is your name? How am I to explain to people who are you? Who is this God that we are supposed to follow and worship? And so the last time, if you still remember, uh, I think it's last year, we stopped in Exodus. The last time when we were on the book of Exodus, we focus mainly on Moses' responses, or rather Moses' excuses to God's very tough mission of leading Israel out of Egypt. But today, we'll focus on something more important, on what God said. So last time, it was on what humans, what Moses, uh, he was saying. But today, we will uh, take a look at what did God say with regard to this very challenging mission that he had given to Moses. So today, we'll look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. So verse 13, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So remember this, this is our uh, title for today's sermon. And it's all in caps. Why? Because this is the name of God. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And verse 16, go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the God, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has what has been done to you in Egypt. So in what God is saying, you will notice God's focus is on who? Is on the humans or on himself? He's describing a lot of his action. He said that I've watched over you, I've seen. And next verse 17, he said, I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Whose mighty hand? Is it uh, from some mighty warrior? Is it because Moses is very mighty? God says in verse 20, So, I will stretch out my hand. Again, God's reply always center on himself. But for, our, for ourselves, every time we will look at what we can do, what we cannot do. But God, in his reply, he kept drawing our attention 
to his ability. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders who will perform, I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. And verse 21, again, God say, I, and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards these people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. Notice there's this word favorably in this verse. And so uh, when God asked the Israelites to get stuff from Egyptians, this is not really extortion. And some people say that, in fact, it is appropriate that the Egyptians who have been depriving the Israelites from their rightful wages for being uh, their slave for so long to give the Israelites all this possession. And so whatever it is, when we look at this verse, uh, the last part of the verse, 21 to, 20, 21 to 22, we will realize that when you read it, I don't know whether it occurs to you that it is quite unbelievable, very hard to believe why this group of Egyptians who used to detest Israelites suddenly they can become so kind to the Israelites to offer, and not just um, unwillingly, but offer with favor uh, the articles of silver, gold, clothing, and all this. So we know that behind the scene, it must be because of God's favor on the Israelites. And in fact, this is not the first time that the Bible mentions that the Egyptians will give a lot of good stuff to the Israelites. Many, many years ago, when we read in Genesis, God already told Abraham that when his descendants leave the country of slavery, they will leave with what? With great possessions. And so again, we see that God always remember his promise. Even though he has promised Abraham many, many years ago, right now during the generation of Moses, he still remember and he still prepared to make it happen. And one interesting thing to note as we read this part of the verse is what? Usually, if you think about it, who will be the persons who is capable of taking plunder from their enemies? Usually, it should be very strong, mighty men who is able to you know, uh, defeat the enemy in a battle and then claim a lot of plunder. But here, interestingly, God said that even women could plunder the Egyptians. And so this further highlights what? Highlights the extent of how great a victory God had. Because God's victory is so great that even women can claim plunder from their enemies, the Egyptians. And so, again, when we read this verse, there is this part where it says, when God says, when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. And so this tells us something very amazing. That is, when God sets his people free, he doesn't just bring his people to something like a break-even point. You know, I set you free and bring you back to square one. But God, when he sets his people free, he will give them additional gains. And so, in other words, God doesn't, doesn't just give people freedom, but God also gives his people supplies so that on their journey back to Israel, it's a long journey back to Israel, they will have enough supply, enough clothing, enough uh, food, enough possessions to last them till they reach Israel. And so in the same way, when we read about how God treated his people Israel, that when you leave, you will not, not go empty-handed. In the same way, sometimes we are very puzzled. You know, why did God allow us to go through certain trials? Just like we are very puzzled. Why did God allow his people Israel to be held in captivity or slavery by Egyptians. But the amazing thing is, even though sometimes God allows his people, like you and I, to go through certain trials in life, in the end, we will find that God does not just deliver us out of trial. It's not just end of trial, full stop. But through the trials, God will surely help us gain important blessings and lessons. Perhaps it's lessons of faith, or we will gain more wisdom, or through the trials, or through the so-called trouble that we have been through, that God allowed, perhaps we will get into certain reconciliation of relationship between us and our family members, and so on. So no matter what, at the end of the day, through whatever trials and suffering or challenges that God has brought us or allowed us through, God will not just you know, let, get, get us out of those suffering and leave it as that. He will surely lead us to additional blessings and gains through whatever he allows us to go through. And so today, uh, I'm going to focus mainly on God 
who he is and particularly on God's name. And so God said just now, I asked uh, for your attention just now on God's name, right? So God's name is I am who I am. So let's take a look at this word, this name, I am who I am. So if you zoom into the, the word I am, and if you uh, understand, uh, okay, maybe, I mean you, you won't understand Hebrew, but in the Hebrew language, I am is in the Hebrew imperfect tense. And what that means, okay, Hebrew's tenses are a bit different from our English tenses, but in the in Hebrew imperfect tense, it just refers to an ongoing incomplete action. So when you say that something is ongoing, it's incomplete, it means what? It means that thing happened presently and it will go on into the future. So it has this meaning. So by this tense, we see that I am, which is God's name. It connotes what? It connotes the very important meaning of active, present, and continuous. And so what does this tell us about God? Many, many things. So a few important things that we will draw from just this one line, name of God. So first, I am who I am in the present, active, continuous tense. It tells us that God is what? God is self-existent and he is transcendent. In other words, as we all know, God, he is the creator of everything, of you and I. And just now we read that uh, through him, all things were made and without him, nothing else was made that has been made. So everything, including you and I, we came from God. And just now we also read in the responsive reading that in him, we live and move and have our being. Sometimes we thought it's very natural for us to wake up in the morning, go to work and live our life as per normal. But it is in Him, it is in His will, in His power, in His sustenance that we can live, we can breathe and we can move and work. And so God is over all, through all and in all. So the amazing thing about God is He not just creates an end of, end of story, but when God creates he also sustains and he ensures that everything keeps running. So the fact that today the world is still running and everything can be held together is because God is holding everything together. And what is more amazing about God is he not just exists, but what? He exists on his own. So that's how he's different from humans. I mean, you and I, we are also existing right now, right? But our existence and God's existence is different because God exists by his own, on his own. And so if you ask, where does God come from? I don't know whether anyone asked this question. Where does God come from? Or, or have you been asked this question? Where does God come from? Now, the answer is nobody and no power can bring God into existence. He is right there from the beginning and he will be there at the end. So God, God himself says, as we have many, many verses that we read just now, he is the beginning, he's the end. And he is present since eternity. So, there was a time where there was no creation, right? There was a time there was no trees, no plants, no humans, no animals. There was a time where there was no creation. But there was never a time where God ceases to be present. So this, will, this is very hard for us humans to understand. Why? Because we humans, we live in the confines of time. So we cannot understand what does it mean by God is right there since the beginning. But we need to understand that, again, I emphasize, we are different from God. We live in the confines of time, but God transcends time. And so God exists eternally in the past, present, and future, continuously. So just now we read, he was God. So he, he mentioned uh, God is what? Who is, who was, who is to come, the almighty God. So that tells us God was God last time. When he opened the Red Sea, he was God. Today, he is still God, even though we are in a pandemic. And in future, he will still be God. Although we don't know what challenges, what new problems will strike us in future. But God is the God yesterday, yesterday, today, and forever. He is the only God. And because he is a transcendent God, so only he alone deserves to have the most holy name. And that is, I am who I am. And he deserves the highest praise, highest submission from all of us. Now, to all of us who are believers here, we may find it very uh, strange to explain the fact that God exists. Because why? To us believers, the fact that God exists is a very basic one. It is not like a wow discovery that we don't know. So we'll be questioning, if this is not a very new idea that God exists, why do we have to emphasize 
the fact that God exists in a sermon like this. Because when we leave this church, when we go out into the world, you realize that many people in the world, the way they live, the way they make decisions, the way they run their life is as if what? There is no God. And that's why it's so important that we need to emphasize that God truly exists in sermons like this today. In fact, it doesn't, ma- it doesn't really matter to people of the world whether God exists or not. You know, even if people of the world, they somehow get an idea that perhaps there is God, to them, it didn't really matter whether God exists because in their mind, people would think, you know, God can mind his own business. And for people who really need God, very, very good for them, they can make the choice to believe in God. But as for they themselves, most people in the world, they choose, they still prefer to run their life the way they prefer. And so they still prefer to live life however they are pleased. And the sad thing is what? Even some Christians, even though they roughly know that God exists, but the way certain Christians conduct their life or the way they organize their priorities in life is really as if God doesn't matter. You know, so what if God exists? God exists to serve me. So it is very important for us to realize God really exists on his own terms. And even if we choose to ignore the fact that God exists, one day we still have to answer to God. So the wiser and more blessed response is to start living before the presence of God today. And so the first thing this name, I am who I am, tells us is God, he is not just existing, but he is self-existent. And from that perspective, he is transcendence above all of us. And the second thing that I am who I am tells us about God is what? is that God, he is self-sufficient and he is independent. Now, when we say God exists in himself, it can only mean that. So how can a person exist in himself? Unless he himself is sufficient for everything he needs, for all the power he needs, all the joy he needs, all the satisfaction can be found in God alone. So God is self-sufficient, he is independent. In other words, God does not need need to seek help. God doesn't need people to help him, to boost his honor, to boost his uh, popularity, to boost his power. God does not need to seek a purpose outside of himself. In fact, God is the source of everything, the source of life itself. So in other words, God depends on no one, but what? Conversely, everything else, you and I, the operations of this whole world, economy or science, whichever, everything else depends on God. And so when we so when we say that God can hold everything together by his own power, then it also means that God is completely sufficient to bring to pass whatever he wills and whatever he plans. And interesting, interestingly, when we uh, if you still re- recall Moses, he also asked when he responded to God's calling to lead Israel out of Egypt, Moses asked God one question, who am I, right? But when Moses asked God, who am I? Moses' uh, implication behind that question is, who am I to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? I am completely insufficient for this task. I'm not up to this task. I'm incapable of delivering this mission. But the amazing contrast is, When God replied Moses, who is he? God says, I am who I am. And when God said, I am who I am, he's actually referring to his total sufficiency. So you see the contrast? When we humans ask, who are we? We rightly realize that we are completely insufficient. But when God says that I am who I am, I can do whatever I want. I can deliver whatever I will. God is trying to highlight the fact that he is completely sufficient. And because of God's sufficient power, Moses can be at rest. He can find peace and he doesn't need to fear that he cannot deliver the mission with God's help. So in other words, again, I said, God is trying to highlight and convey to us humans that he is simply who he is. And if he is self-sufficient, what does that mean? It means that no matter how we think of him, it doesn't matter. God does not need our approval to be God. You know, God does, not, uh, God does not need us to certify him as God, then he can be God. Because God is not dependent on us. You know, sometimes we thought, 
uh, how come God needs? Sometimes we, you know, hearing the messages in the church, we some some Christians they have this um, wrong impression. How come God is so needy? Why does God need so much of our time to pray to Him, to read the Bible, to attend church? Why does God need so much of our money, uh, our attention? Why is God so needy? Does He need us to make Him more popular, to give so that the more people worship Him, He become more honorable? The, the truth is, whether we believe God or not, on whether how many people believe God or not, He is still who He is, and He is God. So the history of Israel really told us a lot of neighboring nations besides Israel back in the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament, they mostly don't believe in God. But even though majority of people didn't believe in God, He is still mighty. He is still powerful. He can still deliver whatever He wants to deliver. And so whether we humans, we believe Him or not, He is still God. And whether we worship Him or praise Him or not, He is still who He is. And He is what? He is glory, He is honor. And so God, in other words, he does not need to beg us for our donations, for our time. And you know, some people, when they hear this, oh, wow, God is self-sufficient, God is independent, God doesn't need us to pity Him or donate our time or money to Him, then that's very good. You know, some people, when they hear this, they say, then we can save our time, our attention, our money for ourselves, since God doesn't need that. But the thing is, what we really need to understand is, although God can do without us, we certainly cannot do without God. So when we commit our time and attention to God, it is not just our duty as a cre created being to worship our creator, but it is also for our blessing. So I say again, God doesn't need us, but we need him. So when we worship him, it is not just our duty, but it is also for our blessing. So because God, he is who he is, we should strive to know him as he is. And not try to worship him for who we want him to be. And I'll talk more about that later. So this is the second point. I am who I am tells us that God, he is self-sufficient, he is independent, he doesn't need our approval to be God. And next, I am who I am also tells us what? It also tells us that God is actively present and he is imminent. Okay, so just now I mentioned I am in the Hebrew tense is what? Is it's, uh, in the Hebrew tense, it means it's present and it's active. So God's presence is continuous, it's ongoing. God never leaves us. His presence is always with us. And so when we say that God is imminent, now what does this mean? When we say that God is imminent, it just means that God is present with us in time and space. Although God is beyond time and space, right? God is beyond. God is far above time and space. But despite being so transcendent, so high and mighty, God is near us and not far from us. And I hope that when we hear this characteristic of God, that he is near us and not far away from us, we will find this deep comfort and assurance in us. Because that just means that because God is so near, God is present with us, it means that God sees us in whatever situation we are in right now. And sometimes when we are in the midst of certain struggle, when we are dealing with certain problems ourselves, it may, uh, in, at the human level, we may feel like, God, you don't know. You know, God, you doesn't understand how difficult it is for me. Sometimes we feel like God is turning a blind eyes to our situation. Or sometimes we feel as if God is very distant. He doesn't, he's very far away beyond our reach. But the truth is, whether we sense it or not, God is present with us. And he's not just present. What's the point of having someone who is present but doing nothing? But God is not just present, but he's also active. And by active, we mean that God is working. Although a lot of times, the work that God does is behind the scene. God is using his unseen hands to work for us. But sometimes we only found out about God's work, work five years later, ten years later, one month later, one year later. I mean, sometimes we can see God's work very fast. But sometimes only after 10 years of faithful prayers, then eventually we see, oh, actually in all these 10 years, God has never abandoned us. God has never stopped listen, listening to our prayers. So remember, Jesus' name is Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means what? Emmanuel means God is with us. So again, when we say that God is imminent, he means that God, he cares enough 
to draw near us in whatever situation we are in right now. So, but when we think about God's imminence, we must be very mindful that although God is present with his creation, with us, he is still distinct from us. So this is something very important about God that we need to know. It doesn't mean that God is among us, then he's like equal with us. He is among us and yet distinct from us. So when we say God is distinct, it just means that, as I mentioned just now, God is transcendent. He is above us. He is really beyond us. In fact, sometimes you find it even hard to express God's marvelous work in your life, right? Because God's marvel is beyond human description. And of course, no matter how hard we study the Bible or how long we have been to church, God is so transcendent and above us that we can never understand his spiritual mystery deep enough because God is so profound. He is so unfathomable. So God is transcendent in that sense. But again, why did the Bible, why must the Bible emphasize that God is transcendent and God is imminent? Because God, the Bible doesn't want us to misunderstand any part of God. Because a lot of times when a person only remember that God is transcendent. He will start to feel like this God is very distant. I cannot reach God. I cannot understand God. You know, I cannot uh, come near to God. So we really need to understand that when we say that God is transcendent, it does not mean that God is so different from us, so distant from us that we cannot draw near Him. So God wants us to know that He's not just an impersonal power. He's not just a high and mighty power who doesn't want intimacy with his creation. But our God, he's a personal God. And because precisely, God knows that we humans, we wouldn't be able to reach God at his high level. With our limited human capacity, our mental understanding, our limited uh, perspective of things, we will never be able to fathom God. And that's why God reveals himself. So one, one evidence of God's love is he reveals himself to lower beings like us. We cannot reach him. We cannot understand him. We cannot see him. We cannot hear him. But because God wants a relationship with us, God cares for us. So God, God borders to reveal himself, reveal his love, reveal his promises, reveal his power and wisdom to us. And that's why this mighty God, he came down to our level. He knows we cannot reach his high level. So Jesus came down to earth to meet mankind. And so we really need to understand God's heart. Because although God has every right and authority over his created beings like us, at the heart of God's covenant, if you know, we always hear the word covenant. But do you know what is at the heart of God's covenant? God's covenant is not just you know, you have to obey me, full stop. But God's, at the heart of God's covenant is a relationship that is characterized by love and intimacy. So that represents God's heart. God is not just op oppressing us with his authority. But when God comes to us, he comes to us to form a relationship of love and intimacy with us. So we, we must be very, very careful not to fall into a misunderstanding of God just by only remembering one side of God's character. So God being transcendent does not mean that he is unreachable. A lot of people, you know, they feel very frustrated with God because in their prayers, they just somehow cannot meet God. So they always feel like, God, uh, you are so far away. But the truth today tells us that God is active. God is present. He is near us. But again, there's another problem if we keep emphasizing God's imminence. Why? Because we humans, you know, we humans, even something good is given to us, we tend to abuse it. So when we overemphasize God's imminence, God's presence, God's active work, and God's nearest, near, nearness to us, after a while, we humans will start to abuse this intimacy that God has showered upon us, right? Because after we keep remembering that God is near us, close to us, we will forget one important thing, that we still need to surrender to God under God's authority. No matter how God is close to us, He is still our Lord and Master. He's still the Master of our life. And our position is merely still God's creation and subjects. So in other words, 
no matter how near, how much God understands us, how much God empathizes with us, how much God loves us, at the end of the day, God still deserves our submission and worship. Because why? Because God is still different from humans. And so, because God, at the same time, He's immanent, He's also transcendent, we cannot simply treat Him like our friend, you know, like our equal. You know, your, your opinion and my opinion, same weight. You know, some, some Christians, they pray to God, they say, oh God, you are, so, you are so immanent, you are so understanding, you understand our heart, you are with us. And when some people, they pray to God, it's as if God is their friend. You know, they just, for consultation, take God's reply as a reference point only. And they don't really care about what God thinks. At the end of the day, we really must remember, we cannot, we cannot belittle or disrespect God even if we are close to God. So familiarity breeds contempt. It's not something that can apply to God. So no matter how familiar we are with God, how close we are with God, we cannot dishonor Him. And so just like our relationship with our parents, no matter how our parents are, they are still our parents. We cannot climb over their heads just because they love us. Because at the end of the day, parents still have a higher authority than children. But at the same time, although parents, they have their parental authority, I believe most parents, if not all parents, they will also desire to have this intimate relationship and closeness with their child. And so, in the same way, although God, He, he is powerful, He has authority, He wants to have this very personal and very heart-to-heart -heart relationship with us. But again, I said, we cannot fall into the state where we um, are inclined to override God, whether it's in our decision, in the way we live our life, or so on. So if we apply this God's presence correctly, we realize that God's presence can indeed be our strength. And this is something for us to confirm. Now, when Moses complained sort of to God that, you know, God, you have given me a, task, a tough mission, God's assurance to Moses is very simple. God didn't say, Moses, I will make your task simpler. You know, a lot of times we go to God and we pray, you know, God, my boss is, is giving me a hard time. We secretly hope that God can change our boss's mind and give us lighter load or easier job. But when Moses complained to God that the task ahead of him is so, the task ahead of him is so tough, God merely told him, I will be with you. My presence is supposed to be your strength. So again, this is the same answer that God will give us today. So when God sends us to a challenge or when God allows us to be in a difficult situation, God's promise may not be, you know, I will make the situation rosy very soon. But God's promise is my presence, my power, my might, my resources will be with you. So this is something we need to confirm. If God is present with us, what do we need to fear? in our situation. I mean, this is again very counterintuitive to the human mind because we are always so easily intimidated by challenges and difficult situations. But as we journey along with God in faith, we really have to confirm how many a times God surprised us that in a difficult situation, His presence indeed gives us strength that we never can imagine. So the mission that God had given Moses in Exodus, if you think about that, we also receive a similar mission from Jesus, and that is the Great Commission. How many of you think that the Great Commission is very easy to do? Um, perhaps some of us, we felt that we already failed in this Chinese New Year where we went out to our relatives and friends, we wanted to share the good news, and then we are tongue-tied, and then we are in, scared, or we have a lot of reservation, and so on. So again, we can feel what Moses felt back then. But when Jesus gave his disciples the Great Commission, will Jesus not know that it's very tough for his disciples? Of course, Jesus will know. But interestingly, when we look at Jesus' um, reply and assurance to his disciples, Jesus said something that is very similar to what God told Moses in Exodus. And Jesus said what? All authority had been given to me, so go and make disciples of all nations and what? And surely... I am with you always. Jesus didn't say, surely you will get very easy re recipients of the gospel. Surely people will welcome you when you share the gospel with them. Surely people will be very grateful to you when you tell them the good news of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus didn't say all these things. But when Jesus gave us the Great Commission, 
I believe he knew how difficult it is because when he himself came down to earth, on earth, to spread the gospel himself, he himself received so much opposition and persecution. So Jesus, Jesus himself knew it is a tall order for us weak disciples. But yet, the only promise, the most important promise that Jesus gave is what? Go and make disciples of all nations and I will surely be with you. So we really need to ask ourselves, when we know that God's power and God's presence is, is with us, can we be emboldened to carry out God's will. So God is trying to tell us that the, the God who commissions us will also be the God who goes with us and empowers us with everything we need. So today we think about what God has called us to. I mean, when we read this Sunday school story about God calling Moses, perhaps today God also called us you know, to spread the gospel to our hardened family members. Maybe God called some of you here to lead a forum group, to lead a cell group, to be a Sunday school teacher, or some of you here to start serving, I mean, especially in the English service, we have a lot of new young servers. Perhaps some of you, you feel you're so shy, but God calls you to be an usher or to bring people to the front seat when everybody say, no, 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 I don't want to sit in, in front. I mean, God calls us to different roles. Uh, some, some of you, you just started to serve in the AV, in the IT. So sometimes we will think, oh, it's a lot of commitment. It, it requires a lot of skills, a lot of new learning and so on. But God will give us the resources we need as long we have the willing heart to submit to his calling. Just as what we saw in the scripture we read just now. When God calls Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, God doesn't just ask Moses to go alone. In fact, if you still recall what we read just now, God said, go to who? To the elders of Israel. And what? I will make them listen to you. And so, in the same light, when God asks us to do his work right now, here and today, God will give us co-workers. Uh, back then, the elders that uh, the elders of Israel, what is their role? Their role supposedly is to help Moses garner the support and the submission of the rest of the Israelites. I mean, of course, Moses is one person. How can he reach out to the whole Israelite community? So with all the elders of the Israelites, they are supposed to help, you know, to manage all the Israelites to support the mission that God has given Moses. So in the same way, God will give us practical help. I mean, I'm sure when Moses heard that God will give him the support of the elders, it will give this hesitant Moses great assurance, right? Because it is practical. So our God is very practical. When he gave us a task, he not just only tell us very spiritual, high and mighty truth, you know, this is the right thing to do, uh, I give you the promise of God, uh, this is uh, spiritual glory. But God understands that we need tangible, practical help as we go about delivering his mission. And so, just as God has provided practical help to Moses through the support of the elders, we need to also confirm when God asks us to do certain things, did he also provide for us co-workers, that support us, encourages us, you know, take our shift when we cannot be on duty that week, or encourages us when we you know, didn't do so well, or we are just learning the rope. God will give whatever resources we need because God knows we cannot do it alone. We need people to support us and guide us along the way. And so power and resources come from God. What does Moses need to do? What does you and I need to do? We just need to trust and obey. Because all that God demands from us is trust and obedience. Because power don't generate from ourselves. But when we are willing to trust and obey God, God empowers us. And so this is the, the third meaning of I am who I am. God is active and God is near us, imminent. And next, very important also, but I'll do it very fast because the next point actually can cover a whole sermon on its own. The next very important point about I am who I am is Jesus himself also introduced himself with I am statements. So this is back to the New Testament. And this draws the connection of Jesus and God. And this also sort of indicated that Jesus himself is God. Because again, I mentioned just now, what is I am? I am in capital letters is the name of God. So Jesus himself, when he said who he is, he also used seven famous statements in the book of John. So very quickly, I'll just run you through. I'll not dwell on each of them because, again, each of them will become a sermon 
on their own. So first, Jesus saying he's one. I am the bread of life. So everyone who goes to Jesus will be satisfied. We will not be hungry anymore. I am the light of the world. I open the eyes of the spiritually blind. I point them to Jesus. I help them see spiritual truth. I am the gate. So I am the gate is related to the next, uh, I am the way also later. So I am the gate to, to God. I am the good shepherd. I take care and I lay down my life for my sheep. And I am the resurrection and the life. So I do not just bless you with what you need on earth because resurrection means what? Things of eternity. Things after this earth. So I give you blessings not just on earth. I give you blessings that stretches even beyond your present time on earth. I'm the resurrection and the life. I triumph over death. So if I can triumph over death, what other things? What other little things that's bothering you that I cannot resolve? What other headaches that you have? What other misery in your life that you have that I cannot resolve if I can even overcome death? And I am the way and the truth and the life. Only by me, only through Jesus, can you reach God? Can you find salvation? And I am the vine. So you cannot break away from the vine. You are just the branches. If the branch breaks away from the vine, what can you accomplish on your own? And after all these seven I am famous statements, Jesus made a eight mention of I am. And he said in John chapter 8, verse 58, he said that before Abraham was born, I am. So to you, you were just thinking, oh, this is just very normal, I am. But back then, the Jews who heard Jesus mention this line, they were so angry that they wanted to stone Jesus to death. So the Jews back then in their context, because they also had the law of God, so they know that Jesus is trying to um, write on God's name, I am. And so to them, they see that Jesus, by saying before Abraham was born, I am, they think that Jesus is claiming that he is God, and they saw it as blasphemy, and they wanted to kill Jesus. So in other words, when we see how Jesus introduced himself with I am statements, Jesus is trying to highlight to us that he is who? In other words, he's trying to tell us that I'm God. In fact, it's nothing wrong for Jesus to use I am to describe himself because he's indeed one member of the Trinity God. And God's name is I am. And Jesus is God. So I'll leave it as that because again, I said uh, this I am statement, I think pastor preached before once, I think in the Chinese sermon. So you can go and listen to that. So what matters here is I am refers to the name of God and there's a lot of meaning behind this, this, this rich name. It tells us how God is surpassing, how God is worthy of our worship and our submission. Okay, so the question for us now is, no, the second part of the sermon is, first part, I spent a lot of time to explain I am who I am, what does this mean? So second part of the sermon, we really need to ask ourselves some serious question. So is this God that you know is the God that you are praying to every morning, every night, in the middle of the day, is this God the same God as this I am God? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. Are we praying today to the God who calls himself I am and who appeared to Moses? Is our theology and our worldview in line with this transcendent God? And when we say transcendent God means we need to worship him on his terms not by our own definition. So, why is it so important that God tells us his name is I am who I am? Because I am who I am is completely different from what? I am whoever you want me to be. So this, God needs to draw out this contrast and highlight very obviously. But sadly, we all know, or we should know, or we can sense it that nowadays, the God that people want to worship is what? It's the second one. The God who can be whoever we want him to be. And that's why God knows the human heart. So he wants to point out to us that I am who I want to be, not who you want me to be. And uh, a lot of times when we observe whether it's Christian or non-Christian, and sadly some Christians also, a lot of times who, what is the kind of God that people like to worship? So if you like your God to give you money, your God suddenly become a money God. So if you need God to heal you, then God suddenly become a what? A divine healer. And if you, got, 
if you need God to take revenge for you, God become your what? Avenger. A lot of times, sometimes we tell God, you know, God, you know, this person has been bullying me. I need you to take avenge, revenge for me. Then he becomes your avenger. And if you want God to massage your ego and tell you nice things, because nowadays, you know, people like to say, hear nice things. And we, we, we also want to hear the same thing from God. You know, God, I, I want to hear how much I'm favored, how much I'm loved, how much I'm blessed, how intelligent I am, how beautiful I am. Also, God, so the kind of God you want is the kind of God that can give you all these things. And so people like a God who can be whatever uh, they want him to be. And that's why they worship God. You know, a lot of times people, why they worship God? Many a times, including Christians, the reason why we worship God is not because he's God. But the reason why we worship God is we want God to be what we want him to be for us. But the thing is, when we say all these examples, I'm not saying that uh, God cannot give us healing, God cannot give us money. But we really need to remember that God, He can give us healing. He can give us money. He can give us beauty. He can give us wisdom, whatever blessings we ask for. But the God who is called I am who I am, He has a sovereign will. He has, he has His sovereign plan and He can decide what He wants to do or what He doesn't want to do. But in fact, humans do not like such a God. They doesn't like people don't like God to have a mind of his own. People don't like God to have his own plan, his own will, but they like a God who simply does human bidding. And they like a God who can be defined by how they want to, to define him to be. So uh, in the human world, a lot of people have different definitions of God, right? So God can be a he God, can be a she God, can be an animal God, can be a solo God, you know, only one God, or can be a multitude of God. And people even think that all gods are the same. So in their mind, a lot of people feel that God cannot be who he wants to be. But God instead must be who we think he is. But that kind of God is not the kind of, that kind of God is not the same I am who I am God that we are talking about here. So if you think about this, there's a lot of authority and honor that is enclosed in this name, I am who I am. You just imagine, can anyone say I am who I am? No, right? Only a person like God with all authority who commands everything, then he has the power and right to say I am who I am. Imagine today you go, you go to anywhere, uh, you want to fight for a parking lot with someone and you just don't cut queue and you drive into the parking lot and people confronted you and, and you say, I am who I am. I like this lot. I don't think people will give you any face, you know. So not anyone can. And you say, uh, if you go around uh, to work and you're always late for work, your boss eh, say, how come you're always late for work? I am who I am. I wake up at 10 o'clock. I come to work at 11 o'clock. I am who I am. Your boss is going to tell you, you can go home and sleep for the rest of the day, you know. Don't need to come anymore. So not everyone can say, I am who I am. I am who I am itself. This name carries a lot of authority and glory and honor. Only God, the creator of the universe, he's entitled to this name. And so once we know the significance of this name, what does it tell us? The implication or the application for us is when we know the God whom we worship is the God who, whose name is I am who I am, then we must conform to God. We need to yield ourselves to God. We need to yield our will to God, yield our plan to God. In other words, we need to obey God and not distort who God is to please ourselves because God, He determines everything. But our problem is, the final point for today's message, although God is I am who I am, our human problem is what? Although God is the great I am, we humans, we constantly want to make our own I am, the little uh, small cap I am, great. So God is the only great I am in capital letters. We want to make our own I am great, as great as God. That is the human problem of many, many selfish sinners. So God, we know, he has all the right to claim that I am who I am. But if any one of us, whether it's you, me, whether we are spiritual leaders, whether we have been Christians for very long, if you or I, we were to do that, we say, I am who I am, 
then we are making a very false and delusional claim about ourselves. In other words, we have overestimated our own importance. So again, I say, a lot of times, what makes humans so sinful in the eyes of God, and in fact, so foolish in the eyes of God, is we often think too highly of ourselves. In fact, we care too much about me, myself, and I, and we like to have our way too often, too much. But we really need to seriously consider if we are not self-sufficient like God, if we cannot control even our tomorrow, just now we sing, I don't know about tomorrow, if we don't know, do not even know our tomorrow, if we cannot even control how long we still have on earth, why do we trust ourselves so much? And if the world today does not revolve around us, like you know, we have been reminded this pandemic, that whether you are rich or poor, whether you are educated or not educated, virus can attack anyone. Now, if the world does not revolve around us, so why do we place so much emphasis on ourselves, our needs, our wants, our self-interest, our feelings, our situations? So when we think about this, when God says, I am who I am, God is trying to tell us only one eye is important. The eye is pointing to God, not to ourselves. So we need to ask, will we be like the elders of Israel or will we be like Pharaoh? The elders of Israel, they heard Moses and they saw the signs that accompanied Moses when Moses went to them. Today, I didn't read about the, the three signs that Moses showed the elders of Israel. But uh, I think I mentioned it last year when we talked about this same account. Uh, in Exodus chapter 4, there's three signs that Moses showed the elders when he went to them. So is the staff turning into snake, the hand becoming leprous or not when it was being placed in and out of Moses' clothes and the water from the uh, now river turning into blood. But whatever the case, they are just some evidence that God allowed Moses to show the elders of Israel. But the amazing thing is not so much about the wonders and the signs. The amazing thing is the response. Because the, the elders of Israel, after hearing Moses and after seeing the signs that accompanied Moses, they believe. So that is the blessed response. They believe. But if you compare to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh have shown, I mean, Moses have shown Pharaoh more than three signs, the ten plagues, and Pharaoh still refused to believe. Moses has spoken to Pharaoh so many times. So a lot of times we always think that, you know, God, if you only show me a miracle, I will give you my whole life. I will follow you faithfully, diligently, obediently. But we must not deceive our sinful, we, we, we must not be deceived by our sinful heart. Because even if we see all the miracles, unless God, God give us the humility and touch us to believe him, no matter how much miracles we see, we, we still won't believe. So, the problem, so we need to ask ourselves, will we be like the elders after hearing about God, after seeing evidences that God has shown us in our faith journey, are we willing to believe Him on His terms? Or are we going to be hardened and still think that myself, the, the, the I am, the small I am, the me, the myself, is greater than God? So this is one question we have to pray about. So it, we will have a problem if we make ourselves if we make our I too big. But God wants us to surrender our I to the great I am. And when we do that, God will have mercy on us. So later today, we will have Holy Communion. Holy Communion is a time where, where what happened? Holy Communion is a time where we profess with our heart that Jesus is the head of the church. We are all his body. In other words, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. So we subject ourselves to his authority. And with reverent worship, we subject our life to his guidance. So that's what we are to do later during the Holy Communion. So again, I emphasize only God deserves to be the great I am. So I pray that we all can share the same heart of John the Baptist. Just now we read, John the Baptist, what did he say of Jesus? He said that he must become greater. I, our little I am, must be lesser. So in conclusion, when we look at we are still at the beginning of the story of Exodus. But when we look at the story of Exodus, a lot of times if people ask you to summarize Exodus, what will, what will, well, what will be your reply? Oh, Exodus is about a story of how God set his people free from slavery. The point here is 
the book of Exodus is not just about how God sets his people free. I mean, to humans, we are always most concerned about solving the problem. So now the Israelites, they are enslaved. So we are very concerned about how this problem will be resolved. So to our human minds, whether it's the Bible story or whether it's our life situation here and now, we are very concerned always about how is God going to fix my life, fix my problem right now. But what is God's um, higher concern? We are concerned about solving problem. To God, it's very easy to solve problem. But God's higher interest is so that we can know Him better. So even if God solves our problem for us, even if God fixes a problem in our life, it could be an illness, it could be a relationship problem, it could be a financial problem, what's the point if God just merely solves our problem, full stop? When God solves our problem, He meant it for us to through that encounter, we can know God better, know what kind of God is He. And so because God wants us to know Him better, because His interest is for us to know Him better, He tells us what His name is. And so it's not just the whole, of, um, whole book of Exodus. In fact, the whole Bible is written to answer one question. And the question is, who is God? Who is the God that we should worship? So the whole Bible is written to answer that question. The whole Bible, whatever you read about it, is to tell us what kind of God is the God that we are supposed to worship. So in summary, who is God? God tells us his name is I am who I am. That refers to God is self-existent. And meaning when he says self-existent, he, he exists from beginning to the end. In, in, in other words, he is eternal. There's never an end to God. And he is transcendent. He, uh, he's above all. And because of that, he is self-sufficient and independent. But the amazing good news is, although God is so high and mighty, although he's so transcendent, although he doesn't need us, although he's self-sufficient, and yet, out of his love, out of his grace, he desires to have a relationship. And not just a relationship of master and slave, but he desires to have a relationship of love, father and child love between him and us. And that's why he's also imminent. He desires to come into our life. He doesn't want to stay apart from our life. He doesn't want to be away from our trouble, away from our needs. He wants to be right there with us. And so this is the amazing characteristic of God. So after knowing how God is, I'm not sure whether you will be willing to surrender your life to this God who calls himself I am who I am. And I pray that we are all willing to subject ourselves to this great I am. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you to help us understand you better. Lord, today we see how great an authority you hold. And today we also are very thankful that despite you being so great and mighty and all sufficient in yourself, Lord, you have mercy on us that you want to come near us. You want us to be a part of your family. You want us to have this relationship with you. So Lord, we pray that the more we know you, the more we have this willing heart to surrender to you, not out of no choice or not out of uh, reluctance, but out of this gratitude and love that we produce in ourselves after understanding our love. So Lord, today as we partake this Holy Communion, Lord, we pray that you prepare our heart to remember how great you are, how loving you are, and how grateful we should be to you. So Lord, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.